Well, good morning, everyone. Morning. Are you awake? If you, if you wasn't before, you are now. Amen. Welcome. And those watching on, uh, on the web, welcome too. Well, this is a day where we're going to meet three amazing people. The first one is Jesus. Amen? Amen. He's the main thing. But we also have two wonderful friends of ours, godly people, uh, Mike McClung, Pastor Mike McClung, and his wife, Kelly. They're from Knoxville in Tennessee, and we've known them for 20 odd years. Amazing men, man and woman of God. And we're so privileged to have him here. Whenever he comes, he brings a freshness about God's word. And let me just say something. Uh, we spoke a little about some of the things he was going to say. Not everything. I was blown away. And we really need to hear this today. So you guys listening on the web, do not, do not switch off. And if you can't get it on live stream, you can always go to uh, YouTube after anyway. So let's just pray a minute. Father God, we just thank you. We praise you. And Lord, we just want to lift you up today. We thank you, Lord, that all of your provision, everything that we require, you bring, Lord. Lord, I thank you for these good folks that are here today. Lord, I pray above all things that they have ears to hear what your spirit is saying to the church today. Love on them, Lord. Meet them where they are. Lord, put your healing arms around them. Lord, speak to them. Lift them up. Lift them up to the place where they know they should be. We just thank you, Lord, for everything you're doing. So, Lord, we say, come. Come today by your Holy Spirit and come into this place today because we want that audience with you, Lord, above all things. In Jesus' name, Lord, we ask. Amen. And by the way, we're going to take up an offering. Um, Ness, would you pick that up? And During the worship, we're going to pick, take up an offering for Mike and Kelly this morning. And uh, they pour out so much, not just here today, but in our home. Let me tell you, they come all the way from America and feed me. And as you can see, I need feeding. Not there, but spiritually. Okay. So bless you. Over to you, Faith. Good morning, everybody. Um, I just wanted to uh, tell you what's going, been going through my head in the last uh, week or so. Um, after I uh, heard a sermon about two or three weeks ago about um, that was taken from Thessalonians, uh, and for the past couple of weeks, I've been thinking about what it is to be an imitator of Christ. You know, years ago, I, it was probably about 20 years or perhaps more, people used to have, young people who were Christians, used to have a band that they wore around their wrist that said um, WWJD. What would Jesus do? And it was a, like a continuous visual reminder to, to um, change our thought patterns and to change our attitudes and to perhaps the way we react to somebody who's just annoyed us. And then you see that little band on your wrist and you think, mm, I won't do what I was planning on doing. Um, and we as Christians also have the Holy Spirit inside of us to, to help us to be more like Jesus. Um, and we're talking about imitating, not mimicking. You get those people that do um, impressions of, a, of uh, somebody's voice, but they're not imitating them. They're just... It, it can almost be uh, ridicule, can't it, when you mimic somebody. Um, we don't want to have a small resemblance to Christ. We want to be really, really good, a really good copy, so much so that even an expert can't tell, a, tell it apart, like when they look at a painting that's been done by somebody who's a, the, real, the real McCoy and then somebody who's copied. And to become an imitator, you need to study that person completely, which means reading your Bible and knowing it inside out and learning about him and spending time in his presence and talking to him, but not only talking to him, actually stopping for a little while to hear what he's saying to you as well. And uh, Jesus said he only did what he saw his father doing. And we're told in Ephesians 5, verse 1, that we are to be imitators of God as beloved children. 
You know, we're called to love each other as we are loved by the Lord. And it's a lifelong practice, not something that we just come along to church on a Sunday morning and do for a couple of hours. Um, but like everything, like everything that's a bit tricky, it takes time. It's a, it's a day by day, step by step transformation that we get a little bit better at. So as we are in his presence this morning, ask Holy Spirit to open your eyes and ears to see and to hear what God is doing so that we can do that too. Focus your eyes on only him so that everything else going on, your circumstances becomes blurry. Speak to him, but also wait and listen for him to speak back to you so you can learn more of what he is like. Lord God, help us this morning as we come to honor and praise you, the king of our lives, to be open to hear your voice and to change ourselves, to be transformed into your likeness so that others may see you through us.
shine from your glorious face.
I don't know where to start here. I just, oh, I am totally undone. Completely. But Lord, we just want to thank you, Lord. Lord, when you touch us, Lord, you really touch us. And Lord, I just thank you, Lord, that you're preparing our hearts this morning for what you have to say to each individual here and corporately, Lord. Lord, we are just in awe of you and your servants, Lord, and everything else and your signs and wonders and the way you treat us, Lord, and you break our hearts and then put them together again. Lord, I want to give you all the praise and all the glory. And now, Lord, as we come to hear your word, I pray, Lord, I thank you for for Mike and Kelly, and as Mike comes up to speak, Lord, I pray that every ear would hear what your spirit is saying to us individually and corporate, Lord. So we give you thanks for Mike. Amen. Come on, Mike. Yeah, I, re- I love this guy. Dude. He's pretty good. <laughs> Good morning. morning. And you can answer back. Man, the worship's just off the chain. When Roy was praying, I just looked down. uh, There's gold flecks all over my Bible now. That's a phenomenon that's uh, very well known. Uh, What does that mean? Well, there's a scripture in Psalm 45 that talks about the queen is dressed in gold of Ophir. And when this phenomenon begins to show up, it's a sign that the bride's getting ready. It's the sign that the bride is being prepared. So that's, that's awesome. That's good for me. Kelly and I and, and, and uh, uh, the Hackett's are in agreement, and that's all that matters. So I'm glad the rest of you showed up this morning. Hallelujah. No. It's a joy to be back. We, uh, we love you all. Uh, our team, if you remember, many of you were here when they were here. Well, that's five years ago, wasn't it? 2017. All of them said to say hello, that they love you. Chris sends his love. All the, Joe, you remember Big Joe from New York? <clears throat> they all send their love to you this morning. And uh, we, we love you. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here uh, Thank God that uh, all of the restrictions and st- things were now have been uh, relaxed. That we could. Uh, it's been three years, and there's a lot been going on here. There's a lot been going on there, and hopefully everybody is uh, moving forward in the purposes of God in spite of everything that's going on. Amen. Amen. And I believe I've got some things I want to uh, that the Lord wants me to share with you. I'm trying to put them in proper order. Uh, There is a lot going on right now, which a lot of us may not be aware of. Uh, How can it, does everybody in here kind of feel like things are shifting? Well, I'm glad you can feel that because they are. There is a shifting, or if you want to use a more biblical term, a shaking, that's uh, been going on now for three years. And one of the things that's been happening is the Lord is separating the wheat from the chaff. The division between the wise and foolish virgins is becoming more and more uh, distinct. Uh, How many of you ever read the passage in Matthew 25 about the wise and foolish virgins? A virgin in Scripture is representative of somebody, my goodness, there's gold all over my stuff now. Thank you, Jesus. All right, that's confirmation of the word that he's given me today because I want to talk about the bride making herself ready, the bride... uh, the bride emerging in this day. And that's what's going on. Man, look at this. I'm sorry. Things like that happen. I'm like a little kid. that goes, What's going over here? I, I'm, maybe I need some spiritual Adderall or something so they can stay on track. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, the parable of the uh, wise and foolish virgins, a virgin in Scripture is representative of somebody that's had their sins cleansed. But the uh, sad state of the parable that the Lord brings out, uh, both the wise and foolish were asleep. 
But when the cry came, the bridegroom's coming. Uh, so get ready for the rapture. He's going to come and rescue us out of this stuff because it's going to get worse and worse and worse. That's what it says, right? See, one of the things that's shifting and shaking right now is the false eschatology that people have believed and been fed. I do not believe in a pre-trib rapture. I do not believe it's scriptural. It was never heard of in the church before 1830. And uh, uh, I think it's been one of the most demonic, disabling things that's ever happened to the church of Jesus Christ. Because the scripture's clear. It says the bride's going to make herself ready. She's not going to be waiting around for some kind of rescue. We know that he's coming. He is not coming until there is a bride ready. We can prolong this and we can prolong this. Every century, since the first century, the church has had the opportunity to get ready to welcome him back. It has never, ever been the Father's plan for it to go this long. And the evil and, and corruption and stuff that's been loosed. Every century, an Antichrist spirit begins to operate, and a Hitler or a Stalin or a Mao or now the tyrannical stuff that's going on around us now with the EU and everything else, they always rise up, and it's because the church has not made herself ready. So God has to raise up a military leader or somebody to put it down so the church will get on with the purpose of getting ready to meet him. He's only coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle. He's not coming back for a bride that's waiting around for something. Well, you know, well, my, you know my salvation's free. Absolutely, there's nothing we can do to be saved. He's, he's done all that for us. But now we have to act in faith on what he has accomplished through the cross. And a part of this is the purification of faith that's going on. Because when the cry was made, behold, the bridegroom comes, come out to meet him. You ever read that? Goichi, that's in the New Testament, isn't it? I think so. I think that's correct. So the thing that we have to come out of, number one, is the compromise. We have to come out of the complacency, but we have to come out of this system. There are two competing systems in the earth that we read about in the book of Revelation. We see Babylon the harlot. We see Zion the bride. All through the New Testament, this begins to emerge. There's a bride and there's a harlot. There's a harlot that's religious, that's wrapped up in the world system, and she says the right things many times, but her lifestyle is a lifestyle of compromise and taking her cues. She lives by the principles and dictates of this world, where the bride of Christ only has eyes for him. Sorry about the camera. I promise to be good. So you see these two systems emerging right now, and you see this division that's taking place between the wise and the foolish. The wise, wise are those who have chosen intimacy and a focus on him, because we're told in the book of Revelation that this bridal company uh, follows the lamb wherever he goes, not where men go, not where movements go. So the Lord has been in the process the last 30 years of bringing that to death in at least a remnant of people that will move forward in him. It's like, in, let me give you an example. It's like in here right now, we've got the lights set up, you know, because of the cameras or whatever. The scripture doesn't say focus on what the light's shining on. This is what happens to us. We get focused on what the light's shining on. But the scripture says in 2 Corinthians 3.18 that we're only transformed into his image when we focus on the light. So we're always looking for signs and wonders. We're always looking for manifestations. And I thank God for that because it confirms it. But he says, it's only by beholding me and concentrating on me that you're changed into my image. And the bride of Messiah that's going to welcome him in his coming will be just like him. So you've got these two systems. One is overseen by the enemy and one is overseen by the Lord Jesus through his agent of the Holy Spirit who is training and working and doing all these things to transform us into the image and likeness of his son, and that is the only bride he's coming for. And until that takes place, he's not coming back. How do I know that? Because the Bible says so. Do you know the most often quoted scripture in the New Testament is Psalm 110? 
Sit at my enemies and sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for my feet. He's not coming back until that happens. There will be a people, a remnant, a bride on this planet who walk over all the power of the enemy, just like he did. Not because they have it intrinsic in themselves, but they have so yielded themselves to the Spirit. They have so yielded themselves and embraced the cross internally that He has literally re-embodied Himself in them. Individually and corporately. This is the bride of Messiah. And there's a separation going on right now. See, a harlot, a bride gives intimacy to her bridegroom just because he's the bridegroom. Is everybody with me? Even if you don't get anything out of it, you lay your life down and you give him, you love him. You, you pour out for him because you're in love with the bridegroom, right? A harlot has to have some kind of reward to give anything back. So we have churches now. Come over here. We've got good children's ministry. Come over here. There's worship. Come over here. Come over here. We got signs and wonders. We got this. And it's Madison Avenue, if you'll pardon the expression. And we got to keep things propped up and excited to keep people there because when the new runs out, uh, runs out when it wears off, we got to come up with another program or another something to keep them there, to keep the tithe coming so we can build bigger barns or whatever. That is called in Scripture a harlot. So I'm looking for those people who, when there's ever, every reason to walk away from him, Every reason not to worship him, every reason not to love him, every reason not to serve him, they still do and go after him out of love because their hearts have been won. They've actually met him instead of people talking about him. So if there's some kind of reward I have to get out of this to serve him, to love him, to minister to him, or to show up, to be a part of a local covenant body, that system is not out of me yet. So he's been working for the last 20, 30 years dealing with the hearts of his people to bring us out of that. And still we try to prop this thing up. And see, that harlot system, that harlot church system, is literally overseen by a spirit of antichrist. Because it's the exact opposite. It keeps the people of God from maturing and coming to Christ's likeness. There's an emphasis here, and I'm glad to hear it, on the recovery of the fivefold ministry. Right? We need the fivefold ministry in the church. The fivefold ministry is one of the means of grace that the Lord has given to bring the bride forth and emerge in maturity. Right? Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16, says he's given apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for to build local churches and have good meetings. And, and Is that not what it says? Well, then that's what I see. Or we're going to build, uh, we're going to have a ministry center wherever, you know, people are going to come and we're going to do this. And, but the image and likeness of the Son... There's ministry going on. There's gifts that are operating, and that's good. But where's the image and likeness of the Son being manifest? It says the fivefold ministry has one job. The fivefold ministry has one job, and that is to bring the, the body of Christ into union with the head and one another. That's what it says. And if you, Have you ever read it? You want to read it? I don't think I have to. They have one job. It's not to build churches. It's not to build programs. It's not even to activate people in their ministry. It's to get them connected, bring them into oneness with the head and oneness to one another. Because we see in Psalm 133, when that oneness is activated and we come into covenant oneness vertically and covenant oneness horizontally, all of a sudden it says the authority and anointing of the Lord himself begins to flow over the whole body. Where people see him and not me with a good anointing and gifting. We've had that. 
We've had anointed vessels in the body of Christ, anointed vessels in the church. We've seen them over the last 20 and 30 years, and many of them wound up train wreck because they did not have the character to carry that anointing. And there's no condemnation for them, but I'm telling you, back in 2007, the Lord told me I'm turning the power off. How many can testify to that? It's like all of a sudden, everything was going on, and meetings were happening, and harvest was taking place and signs and wonders and it's just what happened the Lord said I'm turning this off until I can get a body a remnant of people that actually love me for me and the image and likeness of my son there's a family resemblance in the body so the true bride of Christ we're told in Colossians chapter 3 Christ who is our life are you with me Christ who is our life see the true bride of Christ rearranges her life around intimacy with him. She does not take, well, here's my job, and here's church, and here's the family, and here's education, and I've got Jesus over here, and I got this, and I, and I live just like the world does six days a week, but on one day of the week, Jesus is going to be center. That's a harlot. The true bride of Christ is Jesus is the center of everything, and family, job, everything centers around Him. So the Holy Spirit has been moving and moving and moving and frustrating every plan we have to bring us to brokenness to where He's the center of everything. There's a ministry in the United States, I'm sure probably many of you heard of it, called Focus on the Family. The family is a part of God's perfect order, right? Now, what do we do with this scripture? Luke 14, Jesus said, If anyone loves father, mother, wife, child more than me, you can't be my disciple. Do, are children an idol in our lives? Or are we training these children in His image? Are our kids being raised in this world just like the world is raising them? Or are we raising them according to the kingdom? Are we raising according to His order? What do I mean by that? There's a kingdom purpose for the family, and the kingdom purpose for the family, we're told in Genesis 1 through 3, is to put the glory of God on display before the world. So the kids are over here, and they're in sports, and they're in this, and they're in that. But over and over throughout the scripture, I read about Hannah, and I read about others, Samson's parent, parents, who heard the word of God and said, this is what they're called to. You're going to have a son, John the Baptist, and this is what his job, this is what his purpose is going to be, and there will be no distractions in his life to get him focused. Hello, lights. Every parent ought to hear before this child's born what God has designed them for and everything in their life prayed over Everything in the life that does not center on the purpose of God in that child's life should be discarded. But now we have phones. Did you know the word technon in the Greek is the word child or baby? It's also the root word of the word technology. It can be used for good, don't get me wrong. But the enemy uses it to keep us babies. To keep us from maturing. Because as long as we're focused on that phone or on that tablet or whatever, we can't be focused on Him. Unless you're reading about Him on the tablet. Okay? So, everything I just said is preliminary what I want to talk about. So now that I've offended everybody, and if anybody's offended, if you'll come up here, I'll forgive you. There's something that I read about reprove, rebuke, and exhort. You know, with all long suffering and doctrine, right? Now, I want us to understand what the Spirit is after right now. And I'm telling you, there is a bride being prepared at this very moment. And he has been ruthless in his love toward us.
to re- he he has been actually answering our prayer to to know him better, to know him more intimately, to begin to walk in fullness and walk. He's been answering that by dealing with these things that are not of him in our lives. Can you say amen or oh me? So if you would turn to Revelation chapter 5. That's in the New Testament, Goichi. Okay. I'll pick on Goichi because he's, he's a good friend and he's a, he's a Bible scholar. By the way, can I, I'm going to tell you, you know, Pastor Roy, Apostle Roy can clean this up after I'm gone. But I'll tell you how I train our folks back in the States how to study Scripture. The only hermeneutic, you know that in, in Bible college and, and uh, you call it vicar factory, but in seminary or whatever, there's, a, there's classes you take of hermeneutics. And it's basically how do you interpret the Bible and they've come up with systematic theologies and all this other stuff. Throw it away. Can I tell you, can I tell you how to interpret this? The Lord Jesus He's the final thing God has to say to us. Everything in this Bible speaks to him. Even the genealogies. Everything is to be interpreted through him. So when I sit down to read this Bible and I don't get the image and likeness of Christ out of this, I'm not reading it correctly. Everything in here. He is the final word. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. He is the final word of the Father to humanity. Jesus told the Pharisees, he said, you search the scriptures, think you're going to find life. He said, but they testify of me. He is the centrality of everything. So he has to be the centrality of my life, my relationships, everything, or I cannot be a part of this end time bride. I can go to heaven, thank God, but I can't be a part of this. Because he says, only those who overcome will be a part of this. You can be a part of the bridal company, the daughters of Jerusalem, but there's a bride that has only, only has eyes and heart and thoughts and everything in the life of this bride is centered on Him. So when we say, Jesus, I want to know You, I want to fulfill Your calling or whatever, then He is, he is a jealous God. Not green-eyed jealousy, but He will not share me with anybody or anything. Because is this not what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11? He said, I fear for you. He said, he said I fear for you because I have betrothed you to one husband. And I have a godly jealousy for you. Lest by subtlety and deception you be pulled away from the simplicity and purity of devotion to him. This is bridehood. So when there's something else comes into my life that gets more devotion or more attention than him. That's a seducing spirit. Is everybody with me? I don't care if you agree with me. I just want to know if you're following with me, okay? <laughs> Revelation chapter 5. Well, I'm going to start with verse 1. I gave Vicky starting at verse 8. Uh, <clears throat> and I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Now, if everybody will listen quickly, I'll talk quick. Because right now, y'all are slowing me down. All right? Okay. So if we go over time, it's not my fault, it's your fault. All right? That was divine humor. Okay. Then I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written on the inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or even to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, 
having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now I'm going to share some things with you prophetically. You can test these things. You can believe them. You can accept them or whatever. I believe them. Several weeks ago, uh, let me back up. There's who is now a, a, a good friend of mine. We've talked on the phone many, many times over the last three or four weeks. There's a prophetic minister back in the States. He's actually also in the state of Tennessee. He's over in West Tennessee on the other side of Nashville. We're over here in East Tennessee, and he's over on the west side of the state on the other side of Nashville. His name's Terry Bennett. Have any of you have ever heard of him? I know Goichi has because he watched this video, what I'm about to tell you about. Well, Terry is a true prophet. He's not just prophetic, but he's a true prophet. I mean, he sits in that office. He's on the same level. Some of you may remember Bob Jones and some of the others, that, but he's a true prophet. He has all these wild experiences. Well, uh, on July 17th, at a conference they were having over there, he was telling the story about how April 2nd of this year, he was at a conference and he was ministering. He has Bible open there. It just happened to be open. He said, now he's had, at le- he's had about 15 or 16 different encounters with the angel Gabriel. Incredible encounters. Everything that he has said that, that out of these encounters that the Lord gave to him, everything he said has come to pass. He has a 100% track record. Okay? So he's at this conference and he says, Gabriel appears to him. And walks over and he said his hand came over his right shoulder and pointed right at his Bible. And his Bible was open to Revelation 5. Right here. He said Gabriel pointed and put his finger right there and said this is happening in real time in heaven right now. The Lamb has taken the scroll. This is not metaphorical. Because he says right here in chapter 1, he says I'm going to show you the things that must quickly, shortly come to pass. Why hadn't it come to pass? Because the church didn't get ready. It was already in decline by this time. Jesus has to come to the church at Ephesus and says, you've got wonderful ministry. It's an apostolic center. Nothing, no offense, Roy. It's an apostolic center. They, they're casting out demons. They're doing this. You, you know those who are apostles or not whatever. You've got all these wonderful things going on. But i got this against you. You walked away from me. I'm not the center of your life. I'm not the center of ministry anymore. Repent. You have no right to call yourself an ecclesia if I'm not the center of it. Do you understand that when Jesus appears to John on the Isle of Patmos, here are seven golden lampstands, seven menorahs, and we're told in the first chapter what those lampstands mean, right? What are they? The churches, right? He said these are the seven churches, and Jesus is in the midst of it. And when John is having this vision, he just kind of, in a, in a cursory, hey, there's lampstands there. He's not focused on the lampstands. He's focused on who? Who is in the midst of the seven lampstands. The, the lampstands have no purpose except to put him on display. They don't have a purpose to minister to the community. Their only purpose is to put Jesus' glory and presence and power on display. That's it. He's not wrapped up in the, in, the, in the lampstand. Oh, they've got good ministry at that lampstand. And they've got this at that lampstand. No. The only purpose a local fellowship is to have is to put Him on display. They're not supposed to see us. They're supposed to have an encounter with Him. Hello, lights. That's a true bride. So he comes to Ephesus and he says, Wait a minute. I'm not being put on display. You've got good ministry going on here. But I'm not, not on display. Did he not tell in the Gospels? He said, there'll be people come to me and say, did we not prophesy? Did we not cast out demons? Did we not heal the sick? He said, I don't know you. And the word know there is intimately know you like a bride. Hello, lights. I'm telling you, God's shifting everything right now. The angel Gabriel appears. And I've gotten to know Terry over the last, and he's the real deal. Humble guy. Broken guy. 
And he said, I am just so excited to know there's somebody else in Tennessee on the same page. Because the Lord has been speaking to us out of this now for months. And we hear this. Okay, real time. The, the Lord has taken the scroll. That's the title deed. And he's getting ready to open it. What does that mean? There's no going back. When he starts opening his thing, everything is in process. The judgments of the Lord begin to come into what I call remedial judgments. We're not talking about the wrath of God yet. We're not there yet. We're talking about the judgments of the Lord to wake up to get ready, to get prepared. It's the mercy of God. There's a scripture in uh, Isaiah 26. It says, though grace is shown to the wicked, he does not learn righteousness. It's only when the Lord's hand is lifted up. Isn't that something? But then it goes on to say, verse 8, Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So the next thing you see here, there's this worship and intercession now beginning to rise. We see it going on in heaven, but is it going on on earth? And it's a certain type of incense. It's a certain type of prayer. It's not just, Lord, please heal Aunt Sally's big toe. There's a place for that. There's a certain type of intercession now that has to be embraced and has to be released in brokenness. We see what it is in chapter 6. We're not going to read all these. Where it talks about the souls of the martyrs. By the way, the word martyr, witness, and testimony are the same word in the Greek. Did you know that? So anytime you see the word where it talks about martyrs, we're talking about those who give evidential proof that he's alive. We're not just talking about people who talk about Jesus. There's a lot of people who talk about Jesus. But a true witness of Christ he said in Acts chapter 1, verse 9, you're going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and you're going to stand on the street corner and hand out tracts. Is that what it says? No. That's what it's come to mean from this harlot system. It's been watered down. He said, no, you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit and you will be a witness. You will give evidential proof I'm alive. They're going to know by looking at your life and looking at your lo local fellowship, He is alive and He is Lord. What did Peter preach on Pentecost? He said, this that you hear and see and touch and smell right now testifies that you crucified the Lord of glory and He is alive and He is Lord and Messiah sitting at the right hand of God. We have to understand... They don't have to believe anything we say unless we present evidential proof He's alive. Hello, lights. This was the early church. These were the churches in Ephesus until they began to wane through deception or compromise. And that bridehood was exchanged for ease and comfort and money. And in, this, in, this, in the case of Ephesus, for ministry. You know, ministry can become an idol. And you know what happens to a lot of people when it doesn't work out the way they think it should? And think, why is it taking so long or whatever? They just begin. What did Jesus say about the parable of the servant? He said he's committing his master's goods into their hands, but he took a little bit longer coming back than they thought, and they thought they started compromising. And he started being lax. And just counting it common and just, well, I got better things to do and stuff like that. And it's like, when he comes, he says, they'll have no part of this. See, that's not a bridal soul. A bridal soul is the one who through faith and perseverance right. inherit the promises. Right. Hebrews 6.12. Hopefully this is coming together for us. This is in motion. This is in motion. And we see in verse 13 here of, of Revelation chapter 5. Well, now that the Lamb has taken the scroll, there's a new song being sung in heaven that's never been sung before. We read it here like it's been sung for 2,000 years. No, if this is real time, this song right here has never been sung before in heaven, and this is what they're singing. And guess what? We sang it this morning. Faith, Faith, you have no idea how tuned you are in the Spirit or whoever picked that song. This is what they're saying. You are worthy to take the scroll, right? But look at verse 12. 
Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and glory and honor and blessing. That's what they're singing right now. Guess what? We should be singing on earth. We should be coming into agreement with this. The Lamb should take center. By the way, He's the Lamb, but He's not appearing as the Lamb. This is the switch now. See, there's a lot of people who ain't going to like this. It's the lamb, even though he's a lamb, now he's rising as the lion of Judah. Can I tell you what that means? Well, I'm going to. <laughs> Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 3, he quotes when he comes out of the wilderness in Nazareth, and he's given the scroll, right? He quotes, Isaiah, or he reads Isaiah 61, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he's anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor, etc., etc., and then he goes on and, to, and to, to declare the acceptable year of the Lord, the, the year of Jubilee. And everybody goes, wow, that's awesome. That's not all it says. He stops mid-sentence. He stops mid-verse. You ever notice that? Because it's the day of grace. It's a day of incredible... We've been, been in this day of grace and incredible mercy for a long time. Now that's not going to stop. But he stops because the next sentence says, and the day of the vengeance of our God. Can I tell you now, the Lamb has taken the scroll. We're entering the day of the vengeance of our God. The Lion. It's not just the Lamb. You, he's, let him, he's let the enemy and people run all over us and martyr us now for 2,000 years. That's about to be rectified. Because the cry of the souls of the martyr is, Lord, how long until your justice is released? Now, the worship should be changed. It should have always been this way. The Lamb is center of every song, everything we do from now on. And the intercession now is centered on, Lord, vindicate your name. It's time for your vengeance to be loosed on the earth to move the enemy out of the way. We have to come into agreement with this now. We agree he's still saving people, right? But what now about these principalities and powers that are opposing, that are enslaving people? Tyranny running amok now on the earth. And why is that? Because the church, if the church had made herself ready, it would not be this bad right now. There wouldn't have been a Hitler. Are you with me? We have got to latch on. I mean, we're moving forward. And so the angel appears and points this out to Terry. And Terry turns to the angel and says, we've had this conversation on the phone. He said, I turned to the angel and said, do you mean to tell me that there is actually a people, a remnant people that are prepared or are being prepared to enter into this dimension of bridehood? And he said, the angel leaned forward to him and said, yes. And he says, now he's an old country boy like me. He said, now you're telling me. Because he said, when this angel began to speak to him and show him this, he said the first thing that rose in his mind and his heart was unbelief. Of course, nobody in here, that wouldn't happen to you. It's like, well, how can these things be? Right? Zechariah, John, anyway. He says, now you're telling me that there's actually a people that are, that are embracing the cross and dying to self. They're coming not only out of the world, but they're coming out of the church system to yield themselves 100% to the Lord Jesus as his bride. And he said, the angel, Gabriel leaned even forward. Yes! Why can't you believe me? That'll put the fear of God in you. So what now has to happen? Heaven is activated. Right? Well, God's going to do what God wants to do. No, that's not the way this works. That's not the way this works. Look down at verse 13. This worship and this declaration and this, this intercession is, is going on in heaven. It's an intercession for justice. For the justice of the Lord now to be released into the earth. To make right everything that's wrong. Let me back up just a second. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. 
The judgments of the Lord now need to enter in into a dimension we've never seen before. What do I mean by that? It is completely unjust for people to be sick because Jesus died for their healing. It is unjust for anybody to be bound by demons because Jesus broke the power of the devil and wants to deliver people. It is unjust for anybody to die and go to hell because he purchased their redemption. So when we're talking about not, we're talking about the judgment of God coming upon powers, principalities and powers, moving them out of the way. But at the same time, that's what true revival is. When the power of the enemy is broken, people get saved, people get set free. Are you with me? So when the judgments come in this way, this is the end time move of the Spirit. It's going to be greater than anything the world's ever seen. So this is going on in heaven. In, in verse 13, all of a sudden, every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. For the first time, in all of history, not just one or two people that carry the testimony of God, there is a corporate people on the earth that now is in agreement with heaven. Amen. They are dying to self. It's not about what they want, about fulfilling themselves. They're not the center of anything. Jesus is the center of their lives. Jesus is the center of their business. Jesus is the center of their family. He's the center of everything. That's a bridal spirit. Because they're in love with Him. There is no compromise. And remember, one of the means that He has of bringing this is the fivefold ministry. The fivefold ministry is supposed to prepare this bride. And the other way, the other means He has of preparing the bride to enter into this is 1 Peter 4.12. We're talking about a body, a bride, filled with the glory of the Lord. We're talking about a people who live from within and not without. What do I mean by that? The glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. First, uh, Isaiah 60. Darkness will be on the earth and gross darkness on the people, but the glory of the Lord will what? We're going to have to change the way we even think about revival. Revival is not something that's going to happen out there. We're looking for God to send a parachute of anointing out of heaven and drop on people while we can keep our lives. This last revival is going to rise out of us because we're yielded, we're broken. The Spirit of God is going to flow like a river out of the temple of God. He's looking for a people that live from within and not taking their cues from without because that's just like the world. They live in the inner court. They live in the sanctuary. They live in the Holy of Holies. The outer court is natural light. People in the outer court live by natural light. People, the bride, they have entered into oneness with Him and they live out of supernatural revelation and life. Isn't that awesome? That's available for Him. I'm telling you, this is what He's doing. So the first time now, He's found a people the Spirit and the Bride say come. They have allowed the Holy Spirit to so deal with them. Oh, I was going to say, 1 Peter chapter 4. The fivefold ministry is a means of grace that He has to train us and prepare us. But the other way is called voluntary suffering. He says, don't think it's strange, brethren, that the fiery trial that's come upon you, as so that some strange thing has happened to you, but know this, as his sufferings were, you are embracing the same sufferings so that the spirit of glory and of God will rise and rest upon you. It's a sad thing to say that the only way God can fully manifest his glory in the life of a, of a believer is through suffering. But we resist it. I don't want that. I don't want, to, I don't want to suffer. I don't want to be uncomfortable. I don't want to be misunderstood. You know, it's called the fear of man. And it's got to die. It's got to go to the cross. The fear of what people think. The fear of my reputation. All of that stuff has to pass through death. See, the true bride of Christ has thrown all of that away. 
it, all that matters is him. Him being satisfied. It's a secret to answered prayer. 1 John chapter 3, verse 22 says this. He says, we know that we have those things that we ask of him because we not only ask according to his will, but we do those things that are pleasing in his sight. It's not a have to. It's not a legalism. It's like we, we go the extra mile. We pour out for him because we love him. It's not a have to. It's a want to because you're so in love with him. Well, Mike, I, you know, this is going on. Listen, listen. You don't know my life. You don't know what I've been through. Listen, are, are you going to heaven? You can start there and start to praise him. Quit crying the blues all the time. But this, but this, and yeah, 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 yeah. That's not a bride. That's a whine. There's no whining in the kingdom of God. There's no whining in the kingdom of God. A lot of that intercession I thought I did years ago, looking from heaven's standpoint, it was nothing but whining. That's why he didn't answer it. We pray with thanksgiving. We're thankful in all things, not for them, but in all things. We're developing. We're embracing this discipline from the Holy Spirit according to the word in order to bring us into Christ likeness from within. See, we're wanting power. We're wanting anointing. We're wanting that thing to come, right? He says, I'm not going to release that anymore until I have a people who live from within. And this bridal company, all of a sudden, in the midst of everything that's going on, shifts. And he becomes the center, just like he's the center of life and focus in heaven. He becomes the center of life and focus on earth. Now, we can worship, we can sing the same songs, but it's not going to have the same effect unless from the heart he's the center. Are you with me? But all of a sudden, this song begins to rise from the earth, coming into agreement with heaven. Born by the Spirit, the bride is worshiping, is loving, laying down the life and worshiping and praying, Oh, Lord, vindicate your name. Let justice come into the earth. Let justice come upon the UK government. Yes. I say yes and amen. Change this. Remove the unrighteous from ruling. Right? Well, four of us are in agreement. That's a, that's a quorum. Testimony of two or three is all it takes, right? And what happens? The next thing you see, he opens the seals. Isn't that right? Do I read that? It says, now I saw the lamb open one of the seven seals. He's waiting for the bride to come into a union. The spirit and the bride. When the spirit and the bride say come, you read over in Revelation 22, when he hears the spirit and bride who have become one, corporate with, with the spirit, he says, now I come quickly. See, Esther is asleep in the palace. And Mordecai, who represents the Holy Spirit, is trying to wake Esther up. We're not talking about the daughters of Jerusalem that are out doing their own thing and saying that, you know, they're a, whatever. We're talking about Esther, the true bride, the wise virgins, is asleep in the palace. And the Spirit of God wakes her up. Wait a minute. For such a time as this, you better rise up. Death is all around us. Well, he's going to come. He'll rescue us out of... No, no, no. It's time to rise up. And she puts her royal robes on. She fasts. She prepares herself. She, the bride makes herself ready to go before the king. And when she comes out of that slumber and she comes out of that darkness, now it says that, that they were all asleep, but the wise virgins had enough oil the oil of intimacy. They had a relationship with the Lord. The other ones didn't. See, the, wise, the, the foolish virgins had enough oil for their lamp. What is that? Their ministry. It's all about ministry. I keep the oil in my lamp, keep the ministry going or whatever. But the true wise virgins, they, there was an extra cruise of oil they literally carried in an intimate place. Did you know that? And because they had this cruise of oil they kept in the most intimate places called the oil of intimacy. They had this intimate relationship. They had enough. It wasn't about the ministry. It was about the bridegroom. 
Are you with me? All right. So we're in this place now where he's calling the bride. Esther comes out. She answers the call. And she's going, oh, God. She's dressed in her royal robe. She's dressed. She's the royal intercessor. And what's she coming to do? She's coming to ask for justice for her people that are about to be murdered. Right? And when she stands before the king, there's a scepter extended to her. Wow. Authority. I've been waiting for an authoritative prophetic word. I haven't heard of one in years. I've heard a lot. Well, God's saying this. God, no, he's not. That's all soulish stuff. Now I've heard one. Because this is what God was saying to us, and it bore witness. I've talked to Paul Keith Davis and other prophetic uh, voices, and all of them are in agreement. This is what's going on. So right now, we have to respond to this. Because the Holy Spirit is very, this is not going back. Things are not going back. How many of you ever read 2 Chronicles 7.14? The revival scripture. Remember what it says? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, turn from their wicked ways and seek my face, I will hear and I will heal. Is that what it says? See, there's conditions to get prayer answered. Right? There's no condition to get saved. You believe. You trust. It's a work of God. It's a work of the Spirit, right? He has to be justified in answering that prayer. And he's not going to answer the prayer of somebody who just wants something extra and keep their life. Anybody who wants to save their soul life well, not, you're not going to find it. But if you will lose your soul life for my sake, you're going to find true life. All of these scriptures are going to become very prominent in the next few weeks and months. Because this is what he's saying. Lay down everything for this so you can find everything. This is a bridal soul. Willing even to suffer. You're not looking for suffering. Nobody's, nobody's stupid. All right? You're not, you don't go out looking for suffering. But when it happens, you recognize the disciplining hand of God is here and he wants to train me. And you know who he uses more than anybody else to train you? Those that are closest to you. If somebody on the street walks down and, and cusses you out and calls you this and fusses at you, whatever, it's like, eh, whatever. But if it's somebody that you've had sweet fellowship together, you walk together and all of a sudden they turn on you or they use you or they abuse you or they betray you or something like that, it's like I have the choice that I can either get wounded and carry bitterness or I have the choice to do like he, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I keep the, I'm not burning a bridge, but I'm moving on. You have to recognize God didn't make that person do what they did, but he did allow it. Why is that? So you can grow and become Christ-like. What was your response? What they did, Jesus said in Mark chapter 7, nothing coming from without a man, outside of a man, can defile him. It's the response of what's been done to me that causes me to be defiled. And what that word means, I'm unfit for holy purposes. He can't use me until it's repented of and set right. So we pray that prayer. We come to, we have mass gatherings, come together. We're going to pray for a revival. We've been doing that now for 20 years. Why hasn't he answered it? And I submit to you, it's because he says, I can't be justified in answering those prayers anymore. Because the people that come to these things to pray those things, they're looking for a platform. They're looking for me to do something but hang on to their life. I'm looking for a bride. I'm looking for those witnesses that will lose everything, if necessary, for me to be glorified. That's a bride.
And when he finds that, he will begin to answer quickly. This is where we're at. I believe this with all my heart. And one of the things that we were talking about this week, I'm going to take about 10 more minutes, hopefully, to explain this. Because it leads up to what I've just been talking about. I know I've got those scriptures up there from Genesis 16, but don't have time to do that. I, don't want, to, I want to be sensitive that we can get out of here in time. I hope you're getting something out of this. But in Genesis 16, well, go back before that. When God calls Abraham, Abraham's called the father of faith, right? He's the one through whom Messiah comes. We're not just talking about the Jewish nation or the Israeli nation, but he's the father of all who believe through Messiah. The seed is not the seed of, uh, is the seed of Jacob. The seed is Christ. And all nations are in him, not just Jews. Everybody, listen. You'll hear certain people exalt Messianic Judaism or whatever, even throw that out. God said, don't let anybody judge you according to a Sabbath, a feast, or whatever. Everything is fulfilled in Messiah. Passover, everything is fulfilled in Him. If you are in Him, everything is fulfilled. But we, don't, we can't live our lives any way we want. We live it unto Him and allow Him to live it out of us, all right? When God called Abraham, you know how old he was? 75. Abraham was 75 when God called him. Did you know that? Wasn't a young man. How old are you, Roy? Coming up 75. Coming up 75. Okay. I'm telling you, the numbers right now are going to mean a lot to you, corporately and po possibly even individually. He called him at 75 years old, and he said, leave this place and your family. Know what he said? Why is that? Because your family will keep you from loving me with all your heart. Because they're, they he came out of Ur of the Chaldees, which is, their, they sacrificed humans, they sacrificed babies. This was a part of their worship. He says, leave all that. And it's not just leaving that behind, but then begins the process of God getting it out of him. Because he cannot, everything repro reproduces after its own kind. Is that not right? It's what it says, everything. And so God gets him out of that influence and then begins to work on him because if he has a child while that is still in him, guess what? It's going to be rejected because it's not a child of the Spirit. And Sorry, what happened? Ishmael. God says, I can't use this. Because you've done things, you're operating from the same principles that you learned back here. And so the DNA of that child, the spiritual DNA of that child, was joined to a world system that exalted, that Lucifer rules over, and that it's the hand and heart and exaltation of man under Lucifer that's the center of everything. We're going to work, we're going to make this happen. It's like you hear in, you know, business acumen or whatever. We're going to make this happen. It's like, no, nope, that's not the way a kingdom business is supposed to work. Ness and I have talked about this. If you have a kingdom business, this is the way it should work. Somebody comes into your shop, you're not looking to sell something. You're looking, how can God touch this person, whether they buy anything or not? That's a kingdom mindset. And because you're more interested in God touching this person that he brought into your shop, all of a sudden you'll find out you got more money you can handle. There may be a test. Are you, you understand what I'm saying? It's not that he doesn't want you to sell something, but you understand we've got a different perspective. See, you're dying to self. It's not about me selling something. That's what the world does. Get, 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 get. But the kingdom is give, give, give. Look outside yourself. What does he want? How does he want to touch this? Am I making sense? Okay. So moving into this place now where Abraham comes out of this and then God begins this process of dealing with Abraham. Well, what does he have to do? He stops at Haran. Right? 
He has to stop at Iran. Why does he have to stop at Iran? Because he brought his daddy with him. What did God tell him? Come out of there and separate from your family. Well, partial obedience is disobedience. See, he's come out of the system. We're not a part of that church system anymore. But I promise you one thing, there's probably still a lot of it in us. See, we have to learn to live from within where he's Lord over everything. That's the bride. See, I'm, I'm seeing, showing you how this joins with what's happening now, prophetically. What he's been doing in each one of us individually and corporately in local fellowships. Are you with me? So before he can go any further, he waits till his dad passes away and he says, oh, you can move on now. But then they get down into the promised land, into this old rough, that, the outback, if you will, the Oaks of Mamre, and all of a sudden there's this conflict continually going on. Why is that? Because he has his nephew with him. <laughs> Lot. Hello, lights. Partial obedience is disobedience. God cannot move because he hasn't fully obeyed him. Are you with me? So what does he do? God says, you got to separate from here. Remember I told you back there, separate from that. You're not telling somebody to leave you alone. It's like, I've got to go on with God. If you want to go on with God, this is the way it's going to be. Hello? We've got people in our fellowship right now, and I know there's some here, that they come and their wife and daughter is going to an old, cold, dead Methodist church, and they will not come. They think we're crazy. They think the husband and father's crazy. You don't love us anymore. What? Hearing all of this persecution all the time. But they made the choice. I'm going on with God. I want you to come with me. Praying for him. Praying for him. Praying for him. But we've got to move on with God. We've got a whole family who's, the husband is in the same way. He's going over here or whatever. And she's brought her and her youngest kids. And you would not believe how the, these kids are prophesying. These kids are now on the worship team. We, listen. We have four and five-year-old children. Not only have we trained them, but we've trained the parents and the parents. During our prayer meetings, our intercessory prayer meetings, four or five-year-old kids come up and grab the microphone and pray. Absolutely no mic fry. Because they've been trained. And they're engaging with God. It's not a performance. I mean, they're broken. You ought to hear some of them pray. You want to weep. Unbelievable. And so he, he turns to Lot and says, pick wherever you want to go. We'll give you the choice. Guess what he chooses? Sodom. The world. See, he's a Christian, but he's choosing the things of the world over suffering here. There's nothing to do here where you're at. It's like this out back, this wilderness you're in. You know, you know down there, they've got... Things going on. There's things that we can do. Hey, we can build a church down there and we can see thousands of people come to this church. Now God said here, because He's training me, there's something God wants to do here that's completely and totally different than everything. As a matter of fact, the salvation of the world depends upon me obeying Him. Understand, the salvation of this world depends on this bride separating unto Him. For this to manifest. If not, it's going to keep getting worse and worse. Death, destruction is going to be absolutely off the chain. Are you with me? Yeah. Understand, when this bride reaches this dimension, Psalm 149, verses 5 through 9 says, that he's given an honor to the saints to execute the written judgment. Understand, it's the bride, when we enter into this, we begin with him to exit through our worship, through our intercession. He releases these. He will not do it. It's through the bride's cooperation that the judgments of the Lord enter the earth. But they're coming out of her. This is the gate of heaven. Not that. Right? Isn't that right? Bethel, the house of God. What's the house of God? This isn't the house of God. What's the house of God? What is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Right? This is the gate of heaven. This is the gate that the king of glory comes out of. 
Lift up your heads, O you gates. Let the King of glory, the Lord of hosts, out the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Are you with me? That's what revival is. It's when he breaks out of his people. God didn't show up in Moriah Chapel. He showed up because there was one 26-year-old kid who allowed God, who said, bend me and broke out of him. You've got to change your whole perspective on what revival is. He's going to do something out here. No, he's going to do something in here. Then he's going to flow out and do something out there. Internal preparation. Isn't that right? Isn't that the history of that? But Tolkien was right. Men above everything want power. Without the preparation. So after Abraham separates from Lot, even has to rescue him. Have you ever had to do that? People that don't even like you anymore? We have people call the church office all the time. Mike, will you help us? These are people that have lied about us, slandered us. And when they get in trouble, they call us. Will you pray for us? We've, can I talk to you? Anybody else? That's okay. Isn't that like Jesus? He knew these people were going to betray him. Anyway. So then after this happens, guess what? Eleven years go by. No promise. Eleven years go by, sitting and waiting, waiting on God, looking up at the stars every night. God said, I'm going to make you a great nation, and your descendants will be like the stars of heaven. Sarah, now, Sarah was 10 years younger than uh, Abraham. Now she's 75. She's 75, and Abraham is 86. Are you with me? She's way past. What about that promise, you know? What are we going to do about this? You know, God promised this, and it's like the heir of my house is a servant. He's not even my blood kin. It's like, what are we going to do? And Sarah said, I know what we'll do. We'll do just what they did back in Ur of the Chaldees. We will get a large tent, or we'll get a large building, and we'll put up banners, and we'll put all of these things up. We'll go live stream. We'll advertise. We'll get... We'll get uh, uh, bulletin boards. We'll get all of those things and we'll get the people in here and we will fulfill the call of God for Clevi. <laughs> now, I know you've never done any of that. We at, Lion, we at Lionheart, we never did any of that. I'm lying. Because when you're immature, you've got this word from God, and the first thing God has to do is deliver you from trying to fix it and trying to make it happen. Because it will always produce an Ishmael. And God says, I can't use that. Because it's the arm of the flesh. And it's cursed. Are you with me? So they say, here's what we'll do. We'll do it just like we learned back in Ur of the Chaldees. May, it must, God, you know, God helps those who helps him help themselves. It's not here. God only works. The only thing he accepts is what he does through me. I have to be completely out of the way. It's only the work of the Spirit. You foolish Galatians, you started in the Spirit. Now you're trying to be perfected in the flesh. It's witchcraft. You're manipulating. Manipulating the word of God. Well, it can happen this way. Well, God said, well, what that literally means is blah, blah, blah. Have you ever noticed prophets should never try to interpret their prophecy? That's where they really get in trouble. Just speak what God says and let the Holy Spirit deal with it. Okay. All right. So, here's the way we're going to do it. Ishmael is born. It says, when Ishmael was born uh, in the last part of Genesis 15, it says Abraham was 86 years old. So, in Genesis 17, we get over here, we find out Ishmael now is 13 years old. And they're entering their 14th year. Abraham is 99 and he's getting ready to turn 100. And so God shows up and says, okay, Abraham, I'm ready to do what I said. 
And Abraham goes, what about Ishmael? What are you talking about doing? Look, look, whatever. He said, I didn't have anything to do with this. And here's the sad, sad thing about the whole scenario. Here's one that had face-to-face -face communication with God, right? Abraham. And he's waiting on God, but he loses his perseverance. Right? We'll work this out some other way. For almost 14 years, Abraham hadn't noticed God was not talking. He was so happy with the supposed promise that he forgot God. Hey, I got the ministry. The church is going and we got banners and we've got this and we've got all of those things going. And God says, this isn't of me. I didn't call you to do that. And we're just so happy this has to be God. And guess what? The anointing is there. Why is that? Because the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. They operate up until a point where God says, that's all. Shuts it off. Because now I'm ready, I'm ready for what I have designed to come forward. Are you with me? Yeah. So what does he say? It's got to go. Got to go. It is hindering. The child of the flesh, this work of the flesh, can have nothing to do with the works of the Spirit. Are you with me? Right. You got to get rid of it. He has to send it away. He's brokenhearted. He's weeping. He's crying. He, this is his son. He came up with this thing. He's the one that fathered this thing, right? But it's a work of the flesh. And God says it's got to go. Got to release it. Right? And then when they finally release Ishmael and send it out. By the way, the story says that God took care of Ishmael and Hagar. But God wants a spiritual work. He wants a bride separated to him where he's the center of everything. And everything springs from him through the spirit. That people know this isn't a work of hands. And where the local church doesn't get the praise. But Jesus is projected and he is... He, he is, uh, he's released and he is seen and known through that local fellowship, not the local fellowship. If the local fellowship has the praise, Jesus is not the Lord of it. So he will allow calumny. He will allow gossip. He will allow things to come and disrupt it and bring disorder until we wake up and say, What's going on here? We try to hold it together. We try to balance this out. We try to placate everybody that's got their panties in a wad. That's a southern saying. They got their nose out of joint. Everybody's offended. And so, well, what's wrong? What can we do? Well, if you're having to do all that, guess what? Ishmael. Now, we keep short accounts with one another. If somebody is truly upset, we've offended somebody, we want to make sure it's okay. But you find yourself spinning dishes. Yeah. Roy, am I speaking the truth? Absolutely. You may find this in your own life, in your family, in your job. This translates to whatever dimension you're in. So he says, send it away. And all of a sudden, a supernatural work happens within Abraham and Sarah, that they can conceive. All of a sudden, there is a release of the Spirit that affects them internally. And not only that, people see all of a sudden the aging process not only stopped, but it reversed. Abraham's 100 years old. And all of a sudden, it's like he's 30. Supernatural. Jesus, the glory of God, now is manifesting within him. And now the supernatural son of promise, the supernatural manifestation of the son of God now is birthed into the earth. Hello, lights. But guess what? We still have external Ishmael is gone, right? There's an internal Ishmael that's still there in Abraham. And guess what God says? He says, this promise, 
this child of promise, this supernatural work of grace that I've done, lay it down. Even though we got rid of the external Ishmael, there's an internal Ishmael that has to go. Why? Because even the Isaac could become idolatrous if the heart isn't dealt with. It's not about the ministry. It's not about the promise. It's not about the church. It's not about the thing. It's not about the person. It's about Jesus. Am I making sense? And so he deals. He calls us not only to remove the Ishmaels. We're not a part of that anymore. We've separated from the system or whatever. And then he says, I got a deal in here. So, over the last few years, we've experienced this over the last 10 years. We had a major split back in 2011. 46 people walked out in a week. It's the greatest thing that ever happened. Not at the time, incredibly painful. We had family split. One of our elders now and his wife, who's one of our worship leaders, Ben, Jody, you've, some of you have met Jody. Her mother was a part of the coup that tried to destroy everything. They had to make a choice. We're going to, they didn't go with Mike. They went with the Spirit. They went with Jesus because Jesus said this. We were relegated to 11 people and we met in my basement for what, five years? Something like that. 11 people. Yeah, two basements, back and forth. But guess what? For the first time in my life, I could pour into a people that were ready to move on with God. Because at one time, we had 230, 250 people that were part of Lionheart. We had the International House of Prayer. We had almost 100 hours of worship and intercession going a week or whatever. And guess what? People would come and people would do this, but they could not internally shift to embrace the cross. It was about them, and it was about them, it was about them. It was about them fulfilling their ministry. It was about them, about them being center, them being on stage and being seen, and them. We had one woman who, was, who would come and do a worship watch, singing an hour, singing love songs to Jesus, and the last six months she was doing that, she was planning the whole time to leave her husband and family. Why didn't it prosper? Why aren't we seeing? You know, God promised all these things. I, I, it's Ishmael. And God said, you won't send it away. I'll send it away. Because I'm going to have my way. It was painful. But then God began to deal with us. It was about the cross. It wasn't about a ministry. It wasn't about the house of prayer. It wasn't about the harp and bowl. It wasn't about all the things that everybody's into. It's about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Yeah. And Jesus. But what about me? And then there's me. But what about me? Die, die, die. Death to self. What about my ministry? Lay it on the altar. Why? Because it's going to have Ishmael in it if you don't. For five years, we went through this together. And all of a sudden, God began to bring people. Chris and his dad began to bring people. And they were ready to hear this. And, they, and they've embraced it. And now we've got... 60, 70 folks that show up. It's the most incredible thing I've ever seen, this small group of people. True covenant is there. God's manifesting His glory. Children. Our, our young people, our, our children have a prayer watch on Wednesday. And this was several months ago. One of the, uh, now she's, she's struggled off and on since then, but she, one, of the, one of our teenagers is our senior worship leader's daughter, She's got eczema all over her body. Just broke out all of a sudden. I mean, it was really bad. She was having an exceptionally bad day this day. She came to the prayer meeting. They're, they're worshiping and they're praying. They stop worshiping and they start praying for her. They prayed for her for two hours. They would not stop. Guess what? God healed her. They would, these are 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, 13, 15, 16-year-olds. They would not stop. Until God showed up. I'm seeing something that I saw 35 years ago and it's only now beginning to happen. Why is that? Because God told me, He said, Son, just like Abraham and Sarah, listen, I'm 65 years old. I don't have the strength for this. 
But he said, just like Abraham and Sarah, I waited until they could not possibly bring forth something in the flesh before I moved. And you have to understand something. And this is not a slight. Please don't understand what I'm about to say. There have been people here. They've been incredibly anointed and gifted. But it was all about them. And they wouldn't repent. And guess what? God said, I'm moving them out. So instead of saying, oh God, what have, whatever it's like, thank you, Jesus. Now, Isaac, Jesus now can take center stage because there's a people here that are in love with him and they're not in love with ministry. They're not in love with the limelight. It's not about them being in the light. It's about them pointing to the light. Some of the most anointed worship I've ever heard in my life happened this morning. Incredible musicianship, too. There's no excuse for being sloppy as a musician. You know, it's good enough for gospel. We'll get up here and play this out-of-tune guitar and, you know, pray for... No, 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 shut up. That's worship to slit your wrist by. <laughs> Discipline yourself. Learn your instrument. Be the best you can. But at the, at the end of the day, it's about your relationship with Him and what's coming out of you and not what you're playing. And guess what? This is the most anointed worship I have ever heard in this house. So don't cry over what was. Understand, there's a bridal company here. And some of you, it's time that you made that final decision, I'm in. I'm not on the periphery anymore. I'm not playing any more games. I've been discouraged or whatever. The first thing that has to go is your discouragement. There's absolutely no reason for you to be discouraged. God has given you the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness or discouragement. It's up to you to make yourself ready. It's up to you to take what He says and put it in operation and allow the Spirit of God to discipline you. Are you with me? But understand, the person that did that to you or that experience you went through or whatever, it was allowed by God to bring that brokenness now where Jesus can be everything in your life. It's not the ministry. It's not the thing you were doing. It's the person. If it's a thing, it's an idol. But if it's a person, the Lord Jesus, it's relationship. So, Father, in Jesus' name, I ask you, Lord, to pour in your healing this morning. Because a lot of us just had no clue what was going on. We just thought it was just another thing of the devil. We've gone through this thing over and over. But, Lord, now we have finally got it. Yeah. We've gone through this thing over and over, and we went right back to the old ways. Our minds, our attitudes, our hearts were not adjusted. We thought we were doing right. We were just done wrong by these people, and we were done wrong by these people. But now we realize, Father, we were wrong with you. That our hearts were set on something else, presenting something or being something, instead of Jesus Christ himself being manifest in and through us. So I pray, Lord, that that shift would come this day. Especially in light. You have taken the scroll. This thing is on. Lord, I ask you to accelerate the training here. Accelerate this. I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus you would give everyone here the grace to make whatever choices they need to make to set relationships in order, to let relationships go that do not have any bearing on this and, and, and join in relationships that are going to help them become the image and likeness of Christ. Lord, we lay everything on the altar. The desire for signs and wonders, the desire for this. Lord, all of that's going to come. Greater works than anything that we've ever seen are going to come. But they're going to come from you working them through us. Now, let Isaac come forth. Let Isaac mature. Let the image and likeness of the Son. Holy Spirit, come now. Pour in your oil and your wine. Pour in your healing. Let deliverance come. Open the eyes this morning. Let veils come off of our hearts. Now we understand and we see what you were doing to bring us to this place today. 
And now we can move forward. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you been blessed? Yes. Have you been offended? Yes. Yes, and I have. <laughs> if you, you can only be offended if you can be offended. You can only be offended if, if, if something touches you and makes you think, whoa. But you know, I want to make a confession. You, you know, leaders, they, they kick their own behinds most of the time. Wondering, well, what really have I done wrong? And really, it's about God, isn't it? Right, and irrespective of his grace is sufficient for me to carry on what he wants to do. Yeah. But as a humanist, you tend up kicking your own behind. And of course, your memory, the enemy will take you back when this place was full. When it was full of dancers, full of drama, full of worship, which was a little bit different, but full of all those things. Puppets, outreach. You name it. Now, I want to confess, just not lately, but perhaps for months, I've been kicking my own behind and saying, what did I do? What have I done wrong? And they started to hanker back. And then, but something, every time I hankered for it, something inside of me would stop me. Say, no, no, stand still. Do not do anything in your own strength. I've told the, I've told the group, I ain't going anywhere until he tells me where to go. When we talked over the, over the dinner table and God started to speak to Mike, and the first thing he brought is that what he should have brought, and that's right. And then he spoke about this stuff. Do you know what? It released me. I understand now. And I want to say to all of you who have been in this church and suffered and suffered and suffered through these past years, loving God, yes. but bringing about an Ishmael. Yes. Hard work. And God says, through all the heartache, I had to bring you out to bring you in. Yes. I want to commend all of you who have cried in this place. Yes. All of you who have hurt seeing your friends se seemingly abandon you. And those out there who are listening to this, I know you felt and had the same things going. Yes. This is just about my confession. Let me tell you, I now peace, knowing that that had to go before this Isaac could come into play, what he wants. Now, my humanness is still there, and there will be a, a hunger for to bring back things, but God is saying, no, hold on, hold on, it's coming, yeah. amen? So, Lord, I want to thank you for the day. I ask you to just bless us as we go from this place. Lord, let it work through our... Go home and, and ponder these things. Go back over this. Go into YouTube and listen to it again. But, Lord, I want to thank you for this morning. I thank you for the worship, Lord, and just... Man, I, I haven't had a touch from you like that for a long time. Have your way, Lord. Yes. In us and you out there. And may God bless you, in Jesus' name. Amen.